Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, we're ready to get back into our Father's Word. Book of Proverbs. Remember, Proverbs meaning a set of rules. Rules given to you from the Father through Solomon, uh, that one of wisdom who was very wise in many ways, some ways not so much, but in ways that you could be successful in business, that you could be successful in deciphering that that you should worship, that is to say religion, and um, also uh, with civil governments. Tells you how to get along, how to be successful, how to have God's blessings. And we're in the 14th chapter, and we were, we're going to begin with the 14th verse. And you'll remember this 14th chapter basically gives you reference to the uh, wise and the foolish and the rich and the poor. You will have Proverbs set up along those lines. So, with that having been said, let's get right into it. Chapter 14, verse 14. A word of wisdom from Yeshua, Messiah. We ask it in that name. Amen, amen. And it reads, A wise man uh, feareth uh, I st and uh, departeth from evil. He knows what evil will do for him. All right? he's, he's, he has that uh, cognizance to know the difference. But the fool rageth, and he loses his wit, He'll, and is confident, thinks he knows everything maybe, but actually loses the, pro the process of common sense. That's what self-indulgence, self-importance will do to you if you allow it to carry you away. I'm going to tell you something. Compared to our Father, we are as far as wisdom and knowing something is concerned, almost nothing, I said, in comparison. And then you take those that are foolish and lose even that bit of common sense, hmm, what can you expect? Look around the world, you see fine examples of it in high offices even to this day. Verse 17, he that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. In other words, um, there's no way that he can uh, help but have uh, uh, foolishly brings forth schemes that are not pleasing. And a man of wicked devices or schemes is hated. It just simply uh, follows one following the other. Verse 18, the simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge, or the prudent wear knowledge as a crown. And it is. Knowledge is as a crown to you. People will come to you for advice and so forth. If you wear that knowledge, you don't even have to tell anybody you have it. Again, for those of you that might not have heard, I would like to define prudent for you. Cautiously, a man that cautiously uses common sense. Verse 19, the evil bow before the good, and the wicked at the gates of righteousness. Now that doesn't make too much sense until you break it back to the Hebrew, and then you learn the wicked never win. And then once they lose, they'll be at the gate of the blessed rich man asking for a handout or trying to make points. Uh, especially if you apply that gate as the seat of judgment. The wicked, uh, when we take this to the futurist sense, every knee will bow on the first day of the second advent to Christ, even the wicked. What good will it do them? Well, they'll have to make up their own minds as far as that's concerned. But uh, verse 20, 
the poor is hated even the poor is hated even of his own neighbor that's not all of them but by large part but the rich have many friends in other words there are many people that love to be friends of rich people and many say well rich people are all bad well they that shows their biblical ignorance because to be rich with God's blessings or uh, that is to say to have followed these rules and become successful doing it God's way and with his blessings have become rich uh, that in itself is a crown uh, that is a crown of God's blessings and rich has many meanings to many different people and um, but it is human nature that people don't care all that much. I'm talking about overall, not everyone. But overall, people really don't, if somebody that is really poor, uh, they don't really care that much for them. Uh, well, and uh, that's being human nature. But it is human nature of many that they chase the rich. All right? 21. He that despiseth his neighbor sinneth. So there you have it. If he's poor and you hate him, that's a sin. But he that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he. Mercy, I mean, uh, how can one not have mercy when look at the sins you have committed and God had mercy on you and he sent a son that even paid the price on the cross that having mercy on you, those sins could be just blotted out. They'll never be spoken again when you've repented and been forgiven. How difficult then is it to have mercy on someone that, that um, needs mercy? It isn't difficult at all. It's simply following the footsteps and, um, and let it be mercy and not pity, all right? There is no sin in being poor. It is only a sin to stay that way. I, I consider it so because uh, a person needs to be more can-do, aggressive, blessed by God. Verse 22, do they not err that devise evil? Question. Well, of course they do. But mercy and truth shall be to them that devise good. It, one follows the other. We could even go back to the old cliche, uh, a man reaps what he sows. So you get your own ticket. You are what you wanted to be uh, because of your works. Now, I'll rephrase that again. You may not have accomplished what all you dreamed you would be, but if you're not willing to put out, that is to say to plan ahead, take the, the can-do approach, and sometimes, as the world would say, even a little gamble. It doesn't hurt to, to um, uh, take advantage of an opportunity. That is to say, as some, I'll use an analogy of wading in. Just make certain you have enough knowledge you're not going in over your ankles and that you'll rise up and be successful. Okay. 23. In all labor there is profit. Now, now let that sink in real good because there are no free rides, there are no free lunches. I'll read it again. In all labor there is profit. That's where your profit comes from is your labor and there is no other way. Now, whatever your labor might be, it might be a, a business mind, whatever, but it's your labor. But the talk of the lips are in the Hebrew, let me say idle lips, tendeth only to penury, which is to say, uh, well, well I'll, con, I'll coin uh, uh, from penury, I'll say penniless, okay? That poor, I mean everything gone, that, that doesn't only mean pennies, that means necessities and so forth, 24. The crown of the wise is their riches. That's never apologize for being rich with God's blessings. But what about the old saying, a rich man can't make it in heaven any more than a camel can go through the eye of a needle? Well, that's with, uh, with uh, mammon, which is to say ill-gotten gains. You won't make it that way. 
but riches from God's blessings are your crown. But the foolishness of fools is folly. Folly follows folly. The results of, of the foolish is simply that. Verse 25, a true witness delivereth souls. Now that's good. Now think about it. But a deceitful witness speaketh lies. And what do lies bring? It doesn't deliver souls, certainly. Deception. That's sat one of Satan's main tricks. Deception. 26. In the fear of the Lord, uh, let's translate it reverence, in the loving reverence of the Lord is strong confidence. Is your confidence weak? You can be very confident if you reverence our Heavenly Father, study His Word, and glean His promises. And His children shall have a place of refuge. In other words, um, one that fears the Lord naturally is going to follow our Father's rules, Proverbs, the rest of the Word, and naturally your children cannot help but uh, be rewarded through your riches and the example you set, if you're fortunate, most likely they will walk in that same path or an equally successful path. Verse 27, the fear, here we go again, that reverence, if you break this back to the Hebrew, it's to reverence the uh, reverence of the Lord, to love him, is a fountain of life. You want to find the fountain of youth? Well, he didn't promise you youth always, except he did promise you eternal life, and that's better than youth in the flesh. To depart from the snares of death. In other words, he, in loving him, causes you to escape the snares, the traps that Satan has set in your life, and you will defeat death. O oh, death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? For at death, the spiritual body steps out and returns instantly to the Father that gave it. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Verse 28. In the multitude of people is the king's honor, but in the want of people is the destruction of the prince. In other words, a king's honor is um, how large a kingdom he possesses. And of course, if for a want of people to fill that kingdom, the prince doesn't have much of a shot at it, does he? You could even relate that to the spiritual, and you might say, well, there are sure not that many that really enjoy studying the King's Word all that much. Don't worry. As I forestated on the first day of the Second Advent, every knee, all of them, will bow to Him. Will they stay that way? No, of course not. That's not the, the nature of the beast, because there are some that will still be foolish. But on the first day, the King will have quite a kingdom. Twenty-nine. On the last day, the king will have quite a kingdom. 29. He that is slow to wrath, is slow to anger, is a great, is of great understanding. He's got knowledge. He's got wisdom. But he that is hasty of spirit, that's the easily excited, all right, exalt us folly. You want to be very careful. Um, you, you want to get your mind in gear and think things through clearly, utilizing common sense. If you have a flashpoint, uh, uh, anger to the point of wrath is a form of insanity. And if you place your mind in that position, if you are easily excited, whereby you become filled with wrath to that point, then you border on insanity at that moment. So you want to be very careful in that. Um, usually someone that is quick to anger has a lack of confidence, having been discussed in a, a, a prior verse there, meaning your self-confidence is not very high. 
And there's only one thing that can change that whereby it will really be profitable to you, and that is to get into the promises of God and recognize who you really are. And when one realizes who they really are, that is to say a child of God, think about it. And all these wonderful promises that God put forth for his children, you talk about blessed, then certainly there is no inferiority complex can exist in a can-do type person. It just won't fly. So a person that is sure of themselves doesn't have to be quick to anger. Never confuse this type of wrath, that is to say one that is easily excited, with one that possesses righteous indignation. They're, they are as different as night and day. Never confuse them. Always keep your mind in gear. Don't let it slip to neutral and lose everything. Keep your mind in gear. Think. 30, verse 30, a sound heart is the life of the flesh. A sound heart being the life of the flesh, but envy, that's to say covetousness, all right? The rottenness of the bones. Covetousness, covetousness are to envy and let that burn into your heart. It will take your spirit and warp it. It's so, you know, it's so much easy, it, it is such an easy thing that if you know someone and they've been blessed, be happy for them, don't envy them. If anything, if, if rather than being covetous or wanting what they have, observe that person that was successful as long as it was honest and get you one the same way, whatever that one might be. It is so much better to be blessed of God than it is to be envious, and usually, uh, why does it say that uh, rottenness to the bones? The bone, the skeletal part of your body is what gives your soul, while you're on this earth, mobility. All right, by that I mean you can walk, you can move, you can do things. And envy will absolutely take that and deteriorate it to a point that you can't function. Envy is a very dangerous thing. It will eat you. Verse 31. He that oppresseth the poor reproacheth his maker. That's self-explanatory. But he that honoreth him hath mercy on the poor. Uh, and not only that, you are honored by him inasmuch as he will bless you. God knows, God pays attention. God is aware, all right? He's aware of you. Why, you're his child. Are you not aware of your children? I think so. Well, so is our Father aware of you. He even keeps records. 32, the wicked is driven away in his wickedness, um, but the righteous have hope in his death. Even after death, we have hope, knowing we overcome. Uh, I would translate this, the wicked is driven, uh, and at misfortune, he falls. Can't handle misfortune. Comes to pieces. Worry, worry, worry. Worry warts. Right? Anytime some little misfortune comes up, they did, oh, that's all over. Why did this happen to me? Okay? But... A righteous, we have hope that we even have eternal life after death. There's no way we're going to fall. Okay, verse 33. Wisdom resteth in the heart or the mind of him that hath understanding. You must have understanding before you can have wisdom. But that which is in the midst of fools is made known. Um, okay. Um, a very wise person doesn't uh, necessarily, um, it rests in his mind. He logs it there, he keeps it there, he reasons with it. It's called common sense, it's probably the simplest way to understand it. Whereas 
a fool gathers a little knowledge, and it can be a dangerous thing to him because he'll think, oh, I know everything. I got it now. I could see the whole overall picture. Right? Um, what you want, and he talks about it, uh, and talks about it. Uh, let's go back. But that which is in the midst of fools is made known. He talks, but there's no action. Got that? Talk, but no action. Where the wise rest, absorbs that knowledge, and acts upon it. That makes a big difference. 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation, and it will. But sin is a reproach to any people. It's a disgrace. And unfortunately, our great nation stands in great disgrace uh, part of the time because of peoples in high places in this nation. It makes a difference to God whether he blesses a nation. You can't sing, God bless America, or God bless your nation, wherever you might be from, and have leaders that their morals are decayed, corrupt, and worthless. It won't fly. God doesn't like that. Verse 35. The king's favor is toward a wise servant, naturally. But his wrath is against him that causeth shame. So how can you expect our father to be any different? He isn't. And he's the judge, chief judge. He's the one that blesses a nation or curses it. And you feel it. Don't you think that every living being within that nation feels it? They do. Now. Uh, he has escape hatches, I will use that terminology, for those that are righteous. That, now that's, no one's going to be perfect, but as long as you try to do what is right, God counts it approved, it's right. Okay? And so that completes the chapter that has reference to the wise and the foolish and the rich and the poor, giving you the knowledge of how you should interact with uh, all peoples at whatever category you might fall into, ultimate to do what? To receive God's blessings, to make him happy. He notes, he takes note. Chapter 15, you might say, uh, and you with companion Bibles, you will find in agreements there, is in reference as to your relation in religion or the religious sphere kind of how you get along with other religions and so forth. This will help you. 15, chapter that is, verse 1, and it reads, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. In other words, let the word of God answer, not you. Do you understand that? There's a big difference when you answer questions and letting God's word answer them instead of the man answering them. All right? Answer it with God's word. They're, they, it's soft. It's tough love at times, but it gets it done. Verse 2. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. In other words, if you've got kerosene in a bucket and you pour it out, the only thing that's going to come out of it is kerosene. And if you've got a, an idiot brain and you pour it out, the only thing that's going to come out is idiocy. All right? So stack the deck a little bit and gain a little wisdom and knowledge, and you don't have to worry about that. Verse 3. A man is what he is and what he puts into his heart and mind. Three, the eyes of the Lord are in every place. Boy, he sees you. Every place. Beholding the evil and, note, and the good. Uh, he, I think I said once before, he keeps a book on it then why would God observe the good also? Because that's where the blessings come from, and at judgment, that brings rewards. Judgment isn't a bad thing. Judgment is a wonderful time. Verse 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, 
But perversiveness therein is a breach in the spirit. I want you to think of, uh, I want you to put, I want you to recognize the fact that here we have the spirit, a part of the spiritual body opposed to the flesh body. The flesh tongue is exactly that. It, it, it is flesh. But it is the tool that exercises uh, what your mind is cognizant, uh, is thinking about. All right? Therefore, if you have a wholesome tongue, if you understand the Word of God, if you can uh, debate spiritually, now under, listen to my words, debate spiritually the Word of God, then it, it's wholesome and it will take you to the tree of life, which is Christ himself. But a perversiveness therein, if your flesh tongue is perversive because your mind is, it creates a breach in the spirit, which means it can damage it can damage your spirit, which is to say your intellect, which is to say your eternal life. That's bad. That's dangerous. Five, a fool despiseth his father's instructions. instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. In other words, he cautiously learns to use common sense thinks things through, doesn't excite easily. Six, in the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the uh, revenues, that's to say the gain, the profit of the wicked is trouble. All the time it's going to get you in trouble. If you're crooked getting it, you, it'll, you're in danger even getting rid of it. Um, I could use the analogy if somebody steals a watch and then must hawk it or sell it, you, you run the double risk of getting caught all over again. Seven, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge. Can't help it. Knowledge in, knowledge out. Garbage in, garbage out. But the heart of the foolish doeth not so. What? It has no direction. No, no stability. Uh, how, can, how can they be successful when they are so unstable. Verse 8. I mean, they are so unstable, they can listen to this five minutes and say, oh, yes, that's right. Listen to something else the next five minutes. Oh, yes, that's right. Change their mind 180 degrees and probably will never stop and check God's word to see which one is true. That's what's important. That gives you stability and it, it places you upon the rock. Um... Verse 8. Next verse. It is verse 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. He won't have it. Doesn't want it. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. And he will bless you for it. But you take somebody that uh, tries to play religion uh, and uh, tries to play church and rips everybody off in the neighborhood and then goes down and wants to really bless God, God won't have it. He won't bless because of it. So that, that forces the man to stick to wickedness or that that is evil to, to come by gain rather than through the honesty of God's blessings. I choose God's blessings. Verse 9. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. He loves you that try. He loves you that make a commitment to him. If it's nothing more than to say, I love you, Father. 10. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. Um, and he that hateth reproof shall die. This is, this is uh, I, I would like to work with this just a little bit with you. Sharp correction. Sharp correction um, is for him who forsaketh the way. In other words, he's going to get it. And if you hate that, God's warning, then you're going to die, which means ultimately go to hell. To 11. Hell and destruction, or the grave and the pit, are before the Lord. So is, uh, and destruction is at Babdon in the Hebrew tongue, which is one of Satan's names. You read it in Revelation chapter 9. That's who it's talking about as well. How much more than the hearts of the children of men, Adam in the Hebrew, 
God cares. He's aware of everything. That's what he wants you to know. He never forgets about your heart, dear one, your feelings. But he does want you to love him. Verse 12, a scorner loveth not one that reproveth him. Neither will he go unto the wise. There's no way he's going to the door of wisdom to learn wisdom, and as much especially as all wisdom comes from God, probably he's a non-believer. Or even worse than that, th think of uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses uh, 1 through 4, where it says, in the end times, you're going to have scorners come along and say, ah, ha, ha, where is his coming? It's been 2,000 years, and he's not here. And you still believe? 2,000 years, oh, ho, ho. There's a day coming, don't worry. A scorner does not fear God nor have any respect for the word or quite frankly you. So uh, treat him accordingly. Verse 13, a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. You can tell by looking at a person how they feel. Verse 14, the heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge. Knowledge is the greatest thing next to God that one can possess. But the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. He doesn't know the difference. But you will if you seek knowledge from the right place, and that is to say from your Father in his word. 15, all the days of the afflicted are evil. But he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. You that truly uh, have peace of mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna express it as peace of mind, because of your confidence, because you're, you're not on an ego trip, because you have uh, humility before Almighty God himself. Uh, and because having found that peace of mind, you have the guarantees and the assuredness of our Father. And, and naturally, that's a continual feast on the beauty of life itself, life eternal, better said. Verse 16, better is little with the fear of the Lord, that is to say, loving him, than great treasure and trouble therein. Uh, trouble therein, you, can you figure that one out? Worry, worry, worry again. Well, I got a whole pile of great treasure here, but it just worries me to death what I'll do with it. Everybody's trying to take it from me. I just can't understand it. I'm worried about tomorrow, and I'm worried about the day after that, and the day after that, and I'm even worried about the future. It's just life is such a worry. Well, Worry is to doubt every promise God may, has made. It's the most waste, the biggest waste of time you can ever accomplish if you are a can-do person. I don't care what your place in life is. As long as you're trying, God's going to bless and you're going to make it, and it won't be a worry to you. It'll be a feast. Trouble will come, but hey, you can cut it. Verse 17, better is a dinner of herbs where love is, listen to this, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therein. I I'm going to say, better is it to only have herbs for dinner than it is to have a steak that big, that's what it's talking about, and somebody's griping while you're trying to eat it. There's, there's nothing as bad for a family to have upset at a meal time. You're almost better off to not have a meal than to have upset while you're eating. It doesn't make common sense. It's the root of, of illness of the stomach as well as a sickness in your family. It's better to have bread and water in love than to have that best stake off that ox and have hatred while you glare at each other and partake of, of the best of food. It's not going to do you any good. Your countenance won't witness to it. You're lacking peace of mind. You're lacking self-confidence.
because only people that lack self-confidence uh, would uh, turn to hatred rather than using their mind to derive at a point that you can abridge problems and work things out. I would much rather, rather than having the lettuce sandwich or the bread and the water and love, I would far rather have the love and enjoy the steak, all right? But when it comes to the parable of which is better, naturally, it's better to partake of anything in love than it is hate, because hate spoils everything. So be careful, be mature. Children many times, are they lack wisdom because they're only beginning. But when you're a child, well, perhaps we can understand that. But for adults, I don't understand it. It's not wise. It's foolish. And uh, it should never happen. So remember that. Remember that. Um, always give our Father thanks for everything that we partake of was growing in, some, in and from something he created. It's his. I don't care how hard you work, he created it as well as yourself he created for his pleasure. So bless that in his name and partake of it as a feast pleasing to the stomach. Minus worry, minus covetousness, um, minus foolishness, but with all the blessings of God, gain peace of mind and enjoy your food because that means you're enjoying your family. And let me tell you something, a family is a precious, priceless thing. Wisdom will do that for you and then you will totally understand why he would say in this particular chapter that knowledge and wisdom one wears as a crown if one possesses it. All right? Think about it. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment.